My name is Cameron Schofield. And I would like to share with you some things that I have found very helpful in more fully appreciating the love of God. The love of God is beyond our comprehension. It is strong and it is true, faithful and ever new. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him to a world that was fallen. He sent him to this earth to live a life of much suffering and then to die upon the cross. The love of God did not leave us in our condition, but he made provision that we may have a hope. Jesus Christ came and he lived a life for us. He died upon the cross by his own choice because his love was equal with the love of the Father. However, there is a reality that we need to remember, that Jesus Christ can do so much for us, and yet if we do not appreciate it, then it means nothing. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus says, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you have an illness and you need treatment for that illness, you do not go to the doctor if you don't think you need the treatment. If you don't know you're sick, you don't need a physician. It's the same with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the great physician. He wants to heal our maladies. But if we don't realize that we are sick, we will not go to him for help. Many Christians are like sailors on the sea. When the storm blows and the billows threaten to sink the ship, we panic and we stress. The sailors cry out to God just like we do. And when it is calm and they return to the shore, they go back to their old life. We do the same. After God's wonderful deliverance, we forget all about him and we go about our daily lives. In order to have Jesus Christ continually with us, we need to have a continual sense of need. Not just when life's difficulties surround us, but even in the peaceful times. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, there is a scripture for us to understand. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. All our right acts are as filthy rags. Because of sin, our nature is fallen. We are contaminated. Our motives are impure. Our heart is impure. And everything that we of ourselves can do is corrupted by the pollution of sin. In Romans 3, verses 10 to 12, it says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Jesus Christ here is speaking through his apostle. And he is repeating what has been repeated several times in the scriptures, the very thing that we are very slow to realize. That thing is that there is none that do good. We may look at our lives. We may look at God's requirements. We may think that we are doing fairly well. Well, according to the letter of the law, we may be. But if it is we ourselves performing that act, it is sin. There is none that doeth good. We do not do good. 
all of our doings are full of sin. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus says that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. These individuals had done what God required, hadn't they? They had cast out devils, they had preached in his name, yet he says, you work iniquity. What was the problem? Why was it that even though they did all of these wonderful works, Jesus says, you have sinned? The problem was we. We have done all of these wonderful works. It is we that have cast out devils in your name. It is we that have done this. We that have done that. We does not count. Because if it is we, ourselves, who are performing the works, it is sin. Therefore, Jesus says, go away. You're a sinner. He doesn't want to have to tell us that. So he is seeking for us to understand today what the meaning of these words are. In Romans chapter 14, verse 23, it says, that Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We must have a faith that will operate in our lives. If our works are not the result of that faith, then we are committing sin. When we say committing sin, we are not just speaking of failing to satisfy the claims of God's law, but we are speaking of making life's perplexities worse. We often try to solve our own problems, but we end up dealing with consequences from our own actions that we have brought about because we think that we are capable of dealing with the situation. And I don't know if you're like me, but I'm very prone to put my hands to the task. And it, to me, it's like quicksand. The more I try and wriggle to try and solve my problems, the, the deeper I get. So this message I'm sharing with you now is from my heart because I have made many mistakes in my life and Jesus wants me to understand. And what he has helped me to understand, I'm sharing with you because I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I have made. God doesn't want you to make these mistakes either. And so he has not left us without hope. Whatever is not of faith is sin, Therefore, what is it that our faith can bring to us? In Galatians 5 verse 5, it tells us what our hope is. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That word righteousness simply means right doing. There is hope for us. Hope for us who of our own selves can do nothing right. If we will have the right kind of faith, our faith will bring into our lives a righteousness which is not full of sin. In Isaiah 54 verse 17, it tells us what kind of a righteousness our faith will bring us. It says, This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me saith the Lord. Here God is promising that the right doing in our lives that we need will be his own. Our faith will bring into our practical reality the very works of God himself. In Isaiah 26 verse 12, there is a precious promise. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. The reality of these words can only be known by experience. 
only as we claim the promise and say, God, you have promised. God knows that we of our own selves can do nothing right. And so he has said, that's okay. I'm going to do it for you. All you need to do is to let me actually do it. In Psalm 127 verse 1, it says, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is God himself who needs to be performing the doings in our own lives. Even in the practical things, like building a house. Whatever your employment is, when you even work with your hands, God wants to do that work. He simply wants to work through you. He wants you to choose to let him do all things good in your life. And when God does things, he takes care of the consequences. It is, it is his situation to deal with, and we don't need to deal with it. Sometimes we might find that our employment or our situation at home is beyond our abilities to be able to cope with it. God says, that's okay, I understand. Let me do it then. I will step in and I will actually work in you the very things that need to be done. I would like to give you an illustration of these things by the experience of the Israelites at Sinai. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses recounts the Ten Commandments. And then in verse 22, he says, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. We read this verse and we think that God spoke the Ten Commandments and then he didn't speak anything more. And that which he would have spoken would have been added. But the true reading of this verse is that the Ten Commandments themselves were added. It wasn't part of God's original plan to speak the Ten Commandments. Let's follow this thought through. In Galatians 3 verse 19, it tells us that the law was added. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. The law was added in Exodus chapter 20. What then was the transgression? We will find that in Exodus chapter 19. Let's read verses 1 to 3. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now note there that Israel came to the foot of the mountain. And there at the foot of the mountain they were encamped. This is a very important point. Remember this. Let's read verse 4. He says, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. God here is talking through Moses, and he's saying, remember what I have done for you. You were in bondage, and you could not deliver yourself. I delivered you. I brought you out of Egypt, and I led you away from that which was afflicting you but it pursued you all the way to the Red Sea. And there, you could not escape from it. But I parted the Red Sea. You walked through on dry land and all of that which afflicted you, I drowned in the depths of the sea. And then, remember that you came to the bitter waters of Mara and you were dying of thirst. I made the waters sweet because... You couldn't do it. 
And then when you were hungry, I rained manna from heaven. Remember all of these experiences where you could do nothing to save yourself. It was me. I did it. I am your savior. I am your deliverer. Remember. Now, verses 5 and 6, in remembrance of these things. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. God is asking them to make a covenant with him. He wants to make the same covenant with them that he made with Abraham. God had made a promise to Abraham, and Abraham tried to fulfill that promise himself. And in doing so, he brought much misery upon himself and upon his family. He eventually learned to trust God. And God fulfilled his own promise in the life of Abraham. The child Isaac was born not through Abraham's own doing, but the doing of God. God here wanted to make the same covenant with the Israelites. He says, I will make you a holy nation. I will make you a people without sin. This is my promise. This is my covenant. That if you will accept my covenant, you will be without sin. What a wonderful opportunity God was offering the Israelites. But did they take that opportunity? Verses 7 and 8. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Do you remember the words that we read from Jesus Christ? That not any, everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. There were those who could not enter into God's realm because they themselves performed the works. They said, we have done this. We have done that. We have done many wonderful works. And Jesus said, that is sin. The Israelites committed the same transgression. They said, all that you have said, we will do. They claimed that they would be able to make themselves a holy nation. That they could eradicate sin and all of its problems from their own lives. They made a covenant with death. Because all that they could ever have got out of themselves was death. They were at agreement with the grave. And within 40 days, they were dancing around the golden calf. They had already broken their promise. And yet, even after God spoke the Ten Commandments, they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do it. Even though those commandments were spoken in awful grandeur, with thunder and lightning and the earth shook and this awesome glory of the character and the holiness of God. And these human beings, just like you and me, looked at that and said, yeah, I'll do it. I can do that. We still make the same mistake today. We look at what needs to be done and we think that we can do it. And we leave God out of our reality because we think that in ourselves we are capable of doing it. 
This is a mistake that we are all making. We often think that God gives us the strength to do it. And then we go and perform it ourselves. No, God wants to do the actual performing himself in our lives. Let's see what happened next. In verse 12, God commanded Moses, that thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. Now God prepares to give the Ten Commandments. The law was added because of transgression. What was the transgression? The transgression was claiming to be able to fulfill God's word themselves. This is what caused the entering of the law. And this changed God's manner of dealing with the Israelites. You will remember that the Israel was camped before the mount, but there was no boundary. There was nothing to divide the people from him. Abraham made a covenant with God. Or shall I say, God made a covenant with Abraham. And that's the important point. Abraham accepted God's promise. And he is called in the scriptures the friend of God. His faith enabled him to have a communion with God. That he could dwell in his presence. The Israelites, however, had demonstrated that they did not have the faith of their father Abraham. And God now had to command that a boundary was set around the mountain to keep the people from being destroyed by his holiness because their faith would not bring into their lives his own holiness, that they could not be in harmony together. How many blessings in life do we miss out on? How many times has God wanted to solve the situation for us, but we have thought that we can do with it ourselves? We often think that once we have sorted out the problem, or once the situation makes me feel better, then I'll, I'll come before God and, and then I'll enter back into my union with him. But he wants to be in union with us all the time. He wants to be working and living through us and revealing himself in our lives. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 are very well known scriptures, but we want to understand them in the light of these things. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We read this word, work. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We think, okay, I see what needs to be done and I have to go and do it. But this is wrong. It is God that works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. The fear and trembling part is that we will be found doing the works ourselves. That we will be living our own lives and not permitting God to live his life in us. When we wake up in the morning... We need to be afraid to live our own life. We need to be afraid to do our own thing. We need to fall upon our knees and we need to say, Lord, I cannot do anything right. I believe your word. I know it by experience. So I ask that you will live your life in me today. And we will pray that prayer every single moment as we take him at his word that everything that we do is sin, but he has promised to do all things good within us. 
please continue with us in these appreciations in our next recording that we will understand these things more fully and more practically. Thank you for joining me.